All right, John Mazza, thank you for being on the podcast today. We are going to talk a little bit about, do I call it twang? Do I call it TRS? You could call it either. Either one. If you want to know how it, how all that happened, I can give you the short story. That's what we want. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So the st- short version of that is that I met Keith through Ed Pouton. Ed, okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. Because um, you were living at Ed's house, right, originally? or Well, uh, not originally. My family had moved to Erie my senior year of high school. Okay. I grew up in Harrisburg. Oh, okay. So um, the first person that I met, my first class, whatever, was Durf Hopsegger, and we had six classes together, and Durf was in a band. And I said, hey, I like to follow bands and whatever. So he said, well, John, why don't you come in here? So he had a band with uh, Ed, right? Himself, Ed's brother Bud Puton right. on the drums, and uh, Phil Snyderman, who now lives in uh, Baltimore area, okay, on the organ. And all Academy guys? No, no? actually, Durf and Phil were from Academy. Ed and Bud went to McDowell. Right. That's right. Okay. All right. So. When the band broke up a year or so later and whatever, because Phil was leaving to go to college. Oh, okay. Then um, I ended up moving for a year to York, Pennsylvania. And then I was only there for a year and then moved back to Erie. Okay. So in that first part of that year, around Christmas time, I decided I wanted to come back to Erie and hang out with my friends because I didn't have friends because I was already out of school in York. This is like 1970? This would have been 71. Okay. Okay. Or, well, no. I graduated in 71. So it would have been 72. Okay. All okay. Right. Gotcha. So in 72. So at that time, I came back to um, Erie. I was staying with Ed's family. Right. They had just been in an auto accident and rolled a truck. Oh. And so they had a show to do here in Erie. And so Keith's band at the time, which was called Anacrusis, loaned Ed's band all their equipment to be able to play the gig. Oh, so were they friends already? They had been friends already because Keith went to McDowell also. That's right. So that's the first time that I actually met Keith. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So then I was there putzing with the controls and whatever for Ed's band, and Keith noticed how much better they sounded doing that. (laughs) So when Ed's band finally broke up again a half a year later, Keith went to Ed and said, hey, my band's going to be breaking up soon. We've only got five or six more jobs to play. Is it okay if I ask John if he will run the controls for our band. Right. And Ed said, sure, I don't have a whatever on it. And you had no sound equipment And I had, no, I had no sound equipment right. experience other than putzing with the little sure. Fender mixer that uh, Ed owned. Okay, okay, gotcha. So it went from there, and then uh, we kind of did a bunch of different things together. And then Ed, this, Ed and Keith decided to start a band that they decide, we decided to call Twang. Yeah, why? What was the – just because of the – Just because it was a crazy name. Okay. Okay. Figured, yeah. And we were doing some – the band was doing some crazy things. So they were doing Frank Zappa. I heard about these yeah. crazy things. I heard <laughs> yeah. about Durf doing some crazy Durf, things in that yes. band. Durf yeah. did some real crazy <laughs> things in that band. And Kevin Bensink. And, and, and Kevin Bensink, yeah. yes, and uh, Bob Arlette. Right. And uh, – and, so you're uh, running sound, and you're getting to see all this stuff. I'm firsthand. getting to see all of this stuff <laughs> firsthand, and then after, and then the whole idea of that band originally got together was to start doing original material. Oh, but then uh, t- we were raising money by playing in bars and whatever, and, and drawing big crowds and whatever. So that went on for a little bit until Ed just got tired of the fact that we really weren't going into doing original Originals. material. Gotcha. So or shortly around that time is when Ed moved to New York City. Gotcha. And a bunch of the guys moved out of town. And Keith and I were still here. So then uh, Keith and I just said, hey, you know, why don't we, we start this recording thing and whatever. So the very first thing that I recall us doing, because um, we he didn't have a house yet. Right, he's I, working I, I at Markham's or? He was working at Markham and you're Music. At Warren and I was at Warren Radio. Right, right. So yeah. it's like, so Keith was friends with Frank Williams. Okay. Who's a trombone player who was playing with the band Funky Stygian and Hugh Movement. They were a black band. I don't know that band. Okay. Yeah. and Local they were, band? What? Were they local? Lo- all local musicians. Funky okay. Stygian 
Hugh movement. Yes. All right. Love okay. It. Love the name. And uh, so, um, and they lost their guitar player, and they asked Keith if he would join the band. <sighs> So Keith was like the only white guy right. in this all black band, and it was a big band because they were a horn band. Oh, okay. So it, there were like eight or nine members of the band, and then Keith's the token white guy. <laughs> right. And uh, they had a whole bunch of gigs that they were playing more in the Meadville area than here in the city. Okay. Right. But uh, there were some black clubs that really loved them and whatever. And, Ho- hotel. Or yeah. Stuff ho- like yeah. That. Hotels and whatever. Yeah. So, so that's how. Keith really hooked up close with Frank Williams. Right. And then the other thing was, is Frank Williams was a music teacher at Academy at the time. Oh. Okay. So he was like the band director. Okay. So they had a good relationship. And since Keith was working at Markham's and selling him band instruments or whatever. So it kind of took off for there. So anyway, then they said, Keith was like, we should throw some of these tracks down or whatever. So Keith had bought a... I don't remember if he bought this one yet, or if he just borrowed it from, uh, like, no, well, Markham's didn't have anything like that. The person he knew that had a, a Tascam or a TAC four track was oh. um, was Mike Miller. Oh sure, I know Mike. You know yeah, Mike, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. He's so probably I think, uh, recording tonight. Actually, he does a live stream on Tuesday nights. Oh does, yeah, yeah, he probably. Okay, yeah. so you could ask Mike yeah, Miller okay. about that. Okay, so anyway. So, so Keith read. borrows that. Yeah. Between he and I, we have about four or five different microphones. And uh, I owned a Sony uh, two-track that we mixed down to. Okay. And we started recording. Like live? No. Oh, no. you had him come in? Keith's to- parents' basement. Oh, okay. All right. So how'd well, that go over? Well, <laughs> <laughs> we did, I think, two sessions and... Uh, Mr. Keith's dad, <laughs> who was uh, um, Mike Vacheco Sr., okay. who was the uh, vice president of Security People's Bank. Oh, that's right. <laughs> okay. I remember someone told me that. Came to Keith and said, uh, Keith, it's time for you to find another place to do this. And so... Were you recording originals or, or just covers? We were just rec- recording covers at that time. Okay, all right. So... Um, so then Keith ended up buying a house on uh, 29th and uh, Raspberry, so, and that's where we started the studio. I mean, Keith and you, are you uh, first of all, are you about the same age? Yes. Okay. Keith was actually a month and a half older than me. Okay. So his birthday was the end of May. My birthday was in the middle of July. So when you said uh, you were hanging out with those guys in 72, what year is it now that he's, is it still around 72, 73? No, yeah, this would have been maybe about 74. Okay. Because uh, the whole twang thing or whatever, we were doing that. And we talked about Ed had bought, or no, he was renting a house out in Northeast on the lake. And so we went out there and we were talking about building some stuff out there, but of course it wasn't going to be anything, whatever. And, Keith didn't have a whole lot of experience. I didn't. I had you know, like next to none, other than adjusting some controls for some bands. Right. So then, what happened? I guess I jumped over this step, yeah. which was a bunch. A bunch of us had heard that agency recording studio in Cleveland was offering recording classes oh. in a sixteen-track recording studio. It was a summer course, and uh, I think it was seventy-four that we went up. That we went up there now. You and Keith. It was Keith and I and Bob Berger. Okay. Sure. Um, if you know Absolutely. Bob. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And then the other guy who went with it, because there were four of us that was went, was um, he also plays guitar, and I know him real well, but all of a sudden his name is escaping. That's all right. You've been throwing out a lot of names I've already. I've been throwing out a lot of names. Time. Okay. So anyway. Yeah. When, so the when four it comes of you back go up there. Me, so the four of us went yeah. up there and whatever. And we worked with the, uh, an engineer up there named John Neby, okay. who um, his claim to fame was he recorded There's Got to Be a Morning After oh, yeah. that was used in Poseidon Adventure, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, right, okay? right. So, um, and the agency recording studio was upstairs from the Agora Club. Oh, I've heard so about this. So they used this. to do all yeah. of the nights out at the Agora radio show there. Right. And so they would record all of the, whoever was playing at the club right. below, they would record it all and produce it for the radio program and whatever. So uh, so 16 track. 
16 said. track. All right, so yeah. much bigger than what you're doing. Well, way you're, bigger than what we were doing because at, yeah. oh, at that point yeah. we were just four. Right, gotcha. So, uh, so that's how it all kind of got started. Huh. And then we did a bunch of things on four track for, I want to say, about uh, three or four years. Were you doing remotes? You know, we did a few remotes. Probably the biggest remote that we did was the Zipper City Blues Band. Oh, you were and, still at that time. That was well. We had just bought the eight-track recorder. Okay, all right. So yeah, I was just as I was preparing to come here and talk to you about this. I'm there going, okay, what did we use to, as a mixer? Because back then we had a little Studio Master thing that I think had like twelve inputs and four outputs. So we must have, when we recorded that on 8-track, we must have, reco- you know, like ran the drums and the vocals through All the mixer right, yeah. to two channels. And then we must have hooked the bass direct and the guitars directly into the uh, recorder. Were you, and were you, so you're still working at Warren Radio. I'm still he's, working at Warren Radio. He's, he's still, still at working Markham's. at Markham's. Right. Yes. And um, how does... How does, how does a 20 some year old guy buy a house on 29th and Raspberry or whatever? He had raised enough money from the band. He had raised obviously. enough money. He had some money saved up. You know, so we're just buying a little bit of extra yeah. equipment. You know, uh, I'm not sticking money in my pocket from it because I'm working a day job. Keith was doing the same. Right. So whenever we had extra money, we just throw it in a pot towards buying more equipment. Yeah. And so that's what we were doing. Well, then it got to the point where we realized we needed. We had to get a bigger mixer. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember what year this would have been. It was either 78 or 79. Okay. But we decided we had gone to New York City to the audio engineering convention. We had started doing that right after we got done recording or going to school at agency. Right, right. And so uh, we wanted to see what was out there and who was making what. And there was a company out of Phoenix, Arizona, that was making this board called a Tangent 3216. Okay. And there were all kinds of small studios across the country that were scooping these things up because nobody made something that elaborate for that cheap at the time. What was cheap at the time? I want to say it was like 18000 Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. 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 And and this is how many channels? 16, 16 in 16 in by 16 out. This was the only real option for us to re- move up to the next big step yeah. and still be do it somewhat financially. Yeah, right. So right. if you recall, that was just when the banks just started to shut down loans oh. because the interest rate had shot up to 23%. Okay. And they weren't taking chances on anyone, anyone, especially two guys that barely have any studio experience Experience and want to start a recording studio and spend borrow sixteen thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. His dad legally wasn't allowed to sign the contract. So he sent us to one of the branches and told the guy. Approve them for a loan. Approve them for a loan. (laughs) We got approved for the loan three days before the feds shut anybody Everybody. back off oh, from wow. getting low. Okay. So um, we took out a six-year loan and we paid it off in three. Cool. So once we had the bigger board and we're, you know, there were, all, you know, um, Bob Berger and his brother Jeff, you know, they came and recorded a bunch of things. We started doing all kinds of things. Because you knew so many people Because we point. both knew so many people. And, yeah. of course, then once a few people came in and did that and then – um, the next big thing that kind of happened for us was Jet Radio decided to put out a compilation, compilation of all LP right. of like um, local local acts. Mu- local acts and whatever. Right. I think the album had twelve tracks on it, probably six songs on each side. Right, right. And I think Keith and I recorded ten of the twelve tracks. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, where else were they? Where gonna, else were yeah, they going to go? go out of town? Yeah, right. they'd have to go out of town, or a couple of people did it in their home studio. You know. Yeah. Yes. And so those early days like that, I mean, you obviously recorded his first band in his basement. Right. Was that the only thing you did in his? Parents that basement? was the only thing. Yeah, okay. because his dad was like super limited. Right. Super limited. So then I always think about that 29th Street house. I mean, he's living there. Yes. And at, at a point, Durf's living there too. Yes. Um. How did that work? I mean, you're... It worked not good for any of Keith's friends 
wives uh-huh. or, or uh, whatever, because Keith was married twice there. Okay. Um, Where was the recording? Like, I've been to Walt's, and it's like right in the living room. Yes. You know? So, I mean, so it- the living room was the studio. Keith, we had Keith had a friend who was a finished carpenter, and he built custom cabinetry in the dining room. And so the recording console sat in the dining room with the recorders and whatever. The living room we used, the kitchen we used. Sure. There was a back room of the in the house that was the TV room. We used that. Okay. And uh, sometimes we'd even you know like. Uh, take somebody up into a spare bedroom upstairs and run my cables up the stairs. And, and that's the living space upstairs. And that that's was where the Keith's lived. living space. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So it's okay. like, so we were essentially using every room of the house. Yeah. In fact, I remember Keith, um, he got audited that first year or Jeez, whatever. Of all times. And of course, you know, because he was deducting 90% of his... Uh, um, a lot of expenses. As for, yeah. as for you know, expenses. Right. And so the, you know, the IRS Raised a little came out flag. and looked at it, you know, <laughs> and they they said, well, you know, you're not supposed to be doing this. And he goes, well, but I have to do this because i got no other place and I can't afford right. another place. Yeah, yeah. And, they were, and the guy kind of scratched his head and he goes, what the heck? We'll just let you do small it. Small potatoes. It was small potatoes. Yeah. Yes, it wasn't yeah. enough money for them to go after. <laughs> so the whole time that he lived there, he wrote off ninety percent of the house, all the expenses his, and all that. Or yes, or, and all yeah, the right. expenses oh, yeah. and, and you know food, whatever, and, right, and the mortgage yeah. and the whole ball of wax. How were the neighbors? Any problems? Um, the neighbors only became problems when we started going too late at night. Okay. The neighbors on both sides. Uh, were very friendly to Keith because Keith and I were both friendly to their right. kids and whatever. Yeah. And, you know, we told them what we were doing and whatever, and they were like, you know, yes, after after 8 or 8.30, 9 o'clock at night when people start to go to bed, we'll tone it down. Okay. And we usually did. We would just, like, record just vocals or background vocals or something. Gotcha. Something that wasn't going to create noise yeah. most of the time. How did you split up the duties? Originally, we worked together on most of the projects, but okay. then it just got to be, I think the first projects that we kind of split split it up was that jet radio thing because six of the bands came to us on the last day to get the your songs in. Submitted. Holy cow. So you had to record and mix all of that. And- so we told these guys, look, you're only going to be able to do one song. Right. Um. Keith owned a drum set, so we set up the drum set and told all of the drummers everybody had to use everybody that. Everybody is going to have to use this drum set. Keith had guitars. We didn't want bass amps. We had nice direct boxes right. by that time. So bring your instruments. We'll you know cut the rhythm tracks. We'll do the overdubs. We'll have you sing your parts. We'll mix it. We're going to give you two hours per band to knock all of that off. One song. That's twelve hours. Recording, you said six bands, right? Yeah, so we did 12 hours, and in fact, it actually, I think it went, some of them went over a little bit. So sure. I think we were like at 14 hours straight. Wow. And that night I will not forget because when we finished the last one and they we had just gotten, the you know, all their equipment, whatever, out of the doors, Keith said, John, you look kind of whooped. How about a beer? I said, that sounds great. I hadn't eaten or drinking anything during the day. Oh, jeez. I had a first sip of beer, and I had to slam it down on the t- his kitchen table because I fell to the floor I and bet. passed out yeah. from uh, <laughs> from dehydration. Sure, right, yeah, so, yeah. I will never forget never that. Never forget that. <laughs> yeah. But there were other things that we did for other people that were smaller projects. One of them that I specifically did was... I was more into the uh, esoteric weird bands at that time. Okay, give me some examples. Like Tripod Jimmy. Tripod Jimmy, sure. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so right. uh, the Tripod Jimmy came in and did three tracks and whatever. And so, um, so, we, you... so we did all th- those tracks and whatever and uh, record some things. So then Tom Herman had connections all over the place beca- from playing in Pear Ubu because yeah. they had – Four albums out, five albums out, I think, mm. when, before he left the band. Okay. So um, this guy in Harrisburg who started this custom record thing, whatever, 
and he got bands from Pittsburgh, and he got bands from Erie, and he got bands from Harrisburg on it. But uh, um, he put out this album called Three Mile Island. <laughs> Great thing to call when you're yeah, from right. Harrisburg at the time. Yeah. And so um, he put a couple of the tracks from Tripod Jimmy on that album. Okay. Well, then Lenny Bobby calls me up. John, you know, we're playing down in Pittsburgh or whatever at this bar. And I said, look, I have friends that live in Pittsburgh. Let me come down and whatever. I'll go catch you in the bar. So, uh, and my friends from Pittsburgh decided to meet me at the bar. I got there. I left Erie early to make sure I was there in time because right. I, I hadn't been to this part of Pittsburgh ever before. Gotcha. So gotcha. it's like I didn't want it's too easy in Pittsburgh to get lost. And you're not there. You're just there to listen. You're not I'm there just to there run to listen. Sound so, yeah, anything. I'm not right. there to mix sound or whatever. Yeah. I'm just there to go <clears throat> hang out with the band and whatever because yeah. they had done a couple jobs here in Erie, and then. And I had attended those, and so they were like, John, what, you've been to see our other ones. Why don't, why don't you come down and see it down to there? Yeah. So that's what I said, fine, that's what I was going to do. So I'm there sitting in this bar, having a beer, waiting for the, the yeah, opening the act, which was Tripod Jimmy. Yeah. They were opening for somebody else. And uh, this guy that was from Harrisburg or whatever, he's sitting at the bar too, along with a couple of guys from these other bands from Pittsburgh who were on this same record. Yeah. And they're all talking about whatever, and then they start talking about Tripod Jimmy, and then they start talking about, you know, I and this guy, John Mazza, that mixed these things or whatever, he did an amazing job, and they're starting to whatever. And, and you're there. just overhearing this. And I'm just overhearing yeah. all of this. <laughs> So finally, after them going on for about 10 minutes, I'm there going, okay, John, you can't, you got to be at least nice to him. Right. So I walk over and I said, excuse me, I overheard you talking about uh, John Mazza doing the tripod Jimmy things or whatever. And they said, oh, do you know him? And I said, well, I am him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I introduced myself and, you know, that was the only time we I ever saw any of those guys, but, you know. Right. But it was still. And at the time, did you guys have that? Uh, what was that board called? I apologize. Yeah, the Tangent 3216. So, so at that 29th Street house, you're using... We were using that, that. board, and that board was sonically sta pretty state-of-the-art for the time. Right. That's what I was going to ask. Like, yes. That was probably the best board in town for... Oh, yeah. You know, there was nobody else that had a board that was even close to that. Gotcha. Okay. And you said... Hey, I tended to record some of the more odd bands like Tripod Jimmy. Yes. What are some of the other ones that you remember? Some of the throw, other ones was there was out. a band called Ape that we did. Mm -hmm. There was a band, um, oh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. I've seen a ton of Rick DeBello's uh, real. Yes, well, era. I did some things for, for Rick DeBello from that era. In fact, Rick DeBello put together a, uh, a kind of a rock opera that was called Sammy. Okay. And debuted it at um, the King's Rook Club okay. upstairs. Yeah. And I ended up running the live sound for it. I'm trying to think now. This has got to be right around 1980s-ish. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So we were still recording in, in Keith's house there and whatever. And uh, Rick DeBello had me uh, mix the live sound. And in fact, that's where uh, Chris Eugenio met me for the first time because she went to go see the show. Yeah. And Chris was really impressed with the fact that she didn't have to strain to hear the lyrics. Because I was a guy who, a lot of the young sound mixers these days, they start with the kick drum and then they do the snare drum and then they get the bass in there. And by the time they build up the rhythm section really loud and then start throwing keyboards and guitars and whatever in, there's no room for the vocals for the vocals on top. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was a big fan of the association mm. in the 1960s. Very vocal band. Very yeah, vocal right, band. So right. I was a guy that was always mixed the vocals and then move. Filled everything in around ah, it, okay? And you're not a musician, right? And I'm not a musician. Okay, I didn't know if you played anything. No, I was over not a years. musician. Never so, got the, no, never got the I, bug. I, well, I got the bug at times, but I just didn't have the physical dexterity gotcha. to do okay. it, okay? <laughs> I'm going to be truthful with yeah, you. Yeah. So anyway, but hearing, right. I could hear all of these things yeah. and whatever. So it was just, I would mix how it sounded to me good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, other people thought I was doing that too. So anyway... 
that was when I first started working with uh, the generic beat. I was going to say that had to be at the beginning that, of the yeah, it was right? yeah the beginning of that kind of thing. So yeah. so at the time, we were still eight track, and Chris was convinced Eugenia was convinced that she wanted to do something sixteen track. So there was nobody in sixteen track at that time in Erie, but Paul Pope. Okay who was the lead singer and guitar player for a band in Cleveland. He was famous because he would shove a whole Big Mac into his mouth Okay. while uh, on stage playing guitar. All okay? right. All right. That's and, something uh, to be famous for. Yeah, that's something I to guess. be famous for. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, so she, she wanted you to get yeah, 16. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> he had a, sm- a, a this size studio. Okay, yeah. Which is, a, we're in a very small room right yes, now. Yes, yes, yeah. okay. Yeah. So his room was no bigger than this. And then you walked out into another room, and it's like it was another room this size. And that's where the drums and everything set up. So, huh. so, and he had, he had like four or five microphones. He had no reverb unit. He had no effects. He had no compressors. He had no nothing. He had a really old Fairchild. 16 input by four output board and so he had to switch outputs can only do yeah so they ended up only doing seven tracks on a 16 track recorder a generic beat a generic beat okay. and they did yeah. two songs up there and but she wanted me to you know adjust it and mix it so i rode up with them in their truck came back or whatever gotcha and that's where i met hermie and christine and we became friends and for those folks out there listening so uh John's calling Chris Eugenio. Um, she was the first uh, guest that I had on this episode number one. Oh, Christine yeah. Lorraine Morgan. Now, yes, uh, and she's the bass player that uh, obviously John's referring to in the generic beat. And right, played in lots of other stuff. So and played yep. lots of yeah, other things right, too. Right. So anyway, so that's where we met there. So cool. But anyway, so it was right about that time that Keith and I bought that bigger mixer. Then, well, then after I did two songs or whatever, then Chris. And Hermie came to the studio at Keith's house, and we recorded two or three other tracks for them. Okay, so that CD or that album from the well, that was just kind a of forty-five. A, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, a lot of people were still just doing forty-fives at, oh. at that period of time. Okay. The cassette revolution really didn't start until a couple years later. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, you're recording. Like you said, you're recording kind of the the newer wave or new new uh, music. Yes, is Keith recording something different? Is that what well, you're saying? Well, Keith at that period of time was playing in a live band that was doing some heavier things, and I can't remember the name of the band at the time, but he was playing with Steve McConnell. Is, are they doing original stuff? They're or? doing very little originals, but he was just doing cover things again and whatever. Okay. So, but yeah, the first guy. Who came, and I didn't really work on the album at all, but I did want to bring this specifically up. Yeah. Was Henrik Ostergaard right. was buying guitars and whatever from Keith, and he got, Henrik had connections from all sorts of different places. Right. And so had just formed Dirty Looks. Right. And so he needed to do a demo for these people that he knew in New York City. Yep. That was had it was giving them this chance of getting an album contract. Right. So Hen- Keith, I was not into music that was that, that loud. Heavy. Right. And I'm going to tell you how loud it was <laughs> when they were when the the band had already got done doing their whatever, laying down the rhythm tracks or everything. I stopped over to Keith's house one evening, and Henrik was just doing his lead vocals. He had headphones on his head that he had like duct tape onto his head because he would do move around move so around much. a lot while he was singing. Yeah, and from Keith's, all the doors and windows are closed or whatever because right. we're trying to keep noise out. I could hear Henrik's headphones <laughs> from out on Keith's porch. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So it was loud. It so was that, r- loud. That was not your cup of tea. That was not my yeah. cup of tea, okay? All right. So they recorded the whole album or whatever. All the tracks that are were on the album or that are on the album, Cool Off the Wire, I think his first album was okay. called. All right. 
Gotcha. But what I wanted to tell you, because Keith never got credit for it. Oh. The first song that they released as a single off the album was called Can't Take My Eyes Off of You. And no, it's not the same song as the... Uh, the other one. The other one. Yeah, okay? gotcha. Just yeah. happens to have the same title. Sure. When they re-recorded all of the songs at a studio in New York City with this guy, engineer who was from, and producer who was from England, who had worked on ACDC and some uh, other big Big name, names. Yeah. Big names. Well, when they played the mixes for Atlantic Records, so I would not imagine it was either uh, like Ahmet Ertegun or sure. somebody else pretty high up Absolutely. there. Absolutely, yeah. He liked Keith's mix of that song better. Wow. So all the other songs on the album were recorded in New York City, but the first single off this album and the it's on the album because Keith used to have a copy of okay. it. And we actually compared it to backup tapes that we had at that time. Yeah. It was the mix that we did in Keith's house. And they didn't give him credit? And he never got credit yeah. because Henrik got drunk that night. And when whatever the night that they were calling him and asking about what kind of credits do you want of thing. And he wasn't thinking about Keith and just whatever. Sure. Right. And Keith was a little, he was a little pissed at him. I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Right. But Henrik made it up to Keith. So he said, look, from now on, I'll do all my demos with you, Keith, for all of the albums or whatever. And he did that for the next two albums. Oh, okay. I think they, I don't know how many albums they actually have out, but I think it was five or six. So the band was together for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. And so is Keith recording at this point? Have you guys kind of separated as far as because I know then you move into like choral, you know, recording choruses. And oh well, yeah, we'll see. And, yeah, we'll see. I I did a lot of the that kind of thing, and one of the ways that we started making money to do these things is Jay Long. Um, from Long School of Dance. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I know that name. Do be from Warren Radio. All right. And his dad, who Jim Long, who had founded the d- dance studio yeah. with his wife, Margaret, uh, Marge Long. So they came to me, Jay came to me one day at um, Warren Radio and said, John, we're looking to get somebody new to uh, do our productions at the, every year at the Warner Theater. Oh, and I'd okay. really like you to do it. And, of course, uh, his dad was kind of against changing somebody because I had never done it before. Who were they using before? They were using some guy who just had, like, a sure vocal master, and he didn't have a whole lot of equipment and whatever. (laughs) And uh, Jay just had this idea that he needed to kick it up technology-wise. Right. And because I worked at Warren Radio and could get access to things— and he had heard from other people that I was doing some recording, whatever. Right. But he came to me and said, John, I want you to do this. I said, okay. So Keith and I, we got Keith's band equipment from ATV. Right. And uh, by that time, he had some more equipment. He had a Soundcraft mixer that was a 16-in-4 output. And we did that live for them. And uh, that first year... We got everything set up at the Warner Theater. It's like we were off the side someplace and whatever. And it took me years to talk Jay into letting me be where I wanted to be in, in the front, room. Yeah. But anyway, it was like 20 minutes before the curtain was supposed to go up and somebody tripped over the power cord for the mixing board and ripped it out of the connector. And we're talking about it's like 10 wires. Yeah. And they're all color coded. You got to get the right ones on the right one. And it's like, Keith, go tell Jay that we might have to hold up. And he's like, Jay's like, I can't do that with my mom. She'll freak out. So tell John to get going. So I ran out to my truck, get my soldering iron, came in, took the connector apart, got it all put together, whatever. We fired it up. It came up. It worked. Wow. Two minutes before curtain went up. Yeah, because those are huge events that are super well timed out. My daughter did dance and stuff, and you got a lot of parents in the audience that paid a lot of money, and you're talking hours, hours. Yeah, yeah. Holy yeah. cow! And uh, so, uh, so you had that gig for how long? Thirty some years. Oh my gosh! Wow. So every year when we did that, those shows, or whatever. Um, 
That's great. We would kick the money into the and, studio. And is that what it was? Like, you're still working at Warren Radio. I was still um, working, yes. There was, and, I mean, we would pay ourselves something for doing the show right, because it right. was a lot of work to do the show. But then d- you go on to record, like like I said, like Philharmonic type of stuff. Yes, yeah, so I did like that. And then I did some Philharmonic things, and I did actually, there were some musical things that were done at the uh, dance things or whatever that were done at the Erie Playhouse. Oh, okay. That they said, John, we'd like to record this. And so, yeah, I brought in recorders and whatever and hooked it into the stuff and whatever and we recorded and mixed some of those things too so did you like one or the other i mean obviously there was a lot to like a live performance like of a big um i still like yes i still like doing the the recording studio stuff yeah i I, that's what i really preferred to do do. but um but there were a bunch of different people that I mixed sound for live. And then, of course, when I was trying to think here because... John brought me some tapes, some cassettes. Yeah. He brought me some CDs. Yeah. To take a look Zip, at. I'll, I'll get Zipper some Zipper City was one of the last bands that we mixed at Keith's house. Oh, okay. And then The Void was one of the first, near the first ones. It wasn't the first one that we did in the new studio. At Raven. So we were actually, at Raven. So right. we were actually shut down for almost a year and a half. Because it took me a long time to rewire the new board, and there was ah. furniture we had the guys doing. And what led to that move? What led to that move was um, the Popotnik brothers came to Keith and said, "Look, we're going to buy this building, this school, this school, <laughs> and uh, and we're going to put a music store in there." Right. And Keith wasn't happy at Markham's, and he couldn't see it going anywhere. Oh. So they made Keith an offer to do that, and then they said, look, if you come and work for us, we'll let you pick whatever room you want in the schoolhouse and let you move the recording studio there. Oh, okay. So right. Keith came and talked to me about it, and I said, hey, hey, it sounds like a good deal, whatever. you know. Yeah. I've known Phil for forever. You've right. known Phil for forever, you know. So um, cool old old building too, you know, and a, lot, a cool a old wood, building, yes, you know, and, and all of those kinds of things, yes. yeah. So anyway, so that's what we ended up doing, and we ended up, and then right at that time, also to get back to Henrik, yeah, oh, yeah. Henrik w- had just done two, had the second one at Keith's house, and Keith, and then Henrik was like, oh, you guys are moving and doing whatever, you buying a new, bo- well, we, yeah, we want to buy a new board, and so Henrik goes, how about if I buy the tangent from you. Oh, and this is, now we're talking like 86, 85. This is, uh, uh, yeah, yes. I want to say that's about 86 or whatever. So yeah, because that's, that's when you I moved just to Raven, look right? This yeah. w- about when this one was done. I think this was done in 87. The Void. The Void. Yeah. So it had been okay. like right around 86 or whatever. So that's. Uh, so you've had that board. It's paid off. You've had it for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Technology, technology had to be you know, yes. just advancing so it fast, and you were probably always so like, fast "I want this, I need and that." We, and yes, and we needed a board that had more inputs because as MIDI came out yeah. and all kinds of other things, we were not only using tracks on tape recorders, but we were putting time code on the one of the track on a recorder, right. and we were syncing drum machines and keyboards and whatever to it right. to, to get more inputs on the mix, and we needed a bigger mixer. Gotcha. So um, we had been looking at a Soundcraft mixer, a model called a 2400, for a long time. And uh, it was, they were selling for about 30000 Okay. And we had kind of figured that that was about the best we, we were going to get for the money. And then right about, the, just before we decided to spend the money, Dearden Davies had just announced that they were going to start shipping some of their early prototype stuff to the United States. And they were a real high end or something? Or Well, uh, Dave Dearden had worked for Rupert Neve. So oh, if you know so. anything about who Rupert Neve is, he makes the finest recording consoles of anybody in the world, right. bar none. Gotcha. Okay. So this guy, one of the guys worked for them, and then... Gareth Davies had worked for Soundcraft and had designed the one we were looking at. And then he decided to go with Dave Dearden. And the two of them were going to start a company that they were going to make a board that was a notch above a Soundcraft that was going to have some of the features of Neve boards, but not be in the Neve price range. Sure. Gotcha. Right. And so, and then. They found a niche. 
they found a niche that wasn't being addressed. And so we got one of the very first ones. We didn't get the first one in the United States. The first one actually went to Dave well, Mason. Dave Mason. Dave sure. Mason gotcha. bought okay. the first one. We got the second one. Wow. Okay. And are these, I mean, usually I hear about boards like this, like, you know, the Sound City uh, documentary, you know, uh -huh. you know, Dave Grohl. Like, you know, you hear people talk about how a board is such an integral part of the overall sound then of that studio itself. And there's so few of them made. And there's I mean, so few of them made. Was that the case? Like, this wasn't like a mass-produced no, board. No, there were a limited number of these things made. In fact, the third one that they sold went to Abbey Road Studio oh, D. Okay. So there was one in Abbey Road. We had one, and Dave, and Dave Mason, Mason had, had one. one. All right. Okay. They ended up selling something like 30 or 40 of them eventually. Still, that's not a lot. But yeah. still not a lot. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So you had to wait for that to come from, where was it made? England. In England? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we had to wait for that to come. And uh, a friend of ours, um, Dennis, um, um, so Dennis, Dennis comes Cray. To you. Dennis Cray. Okay. You know Dennis Cray? I don't. Okay. No. Okay. okay. Well, he used to play drums with a bunch of different bands, but then he became a sales rep and whatever and was doing all that. For well, like music equipment? Yeah. Okay. Well, he ended up getting the line for all of Eastern United States because they didn't, weren't expecting to sell that many of them sure, here. Sure, right, right. And so he brought us the brochure and we were like, really? Oh, you got this line? He goes, yeah, I need to at least sell one of them to keep the line. So... How about if I give it to you at my cost? Perfect. So it's like, yeah. so this was like going to so, be a uh, $58,000 board, and we ended up picking it up for like, I think, 32 or 33. Wow. So a little, a little bit more than the sound craft? more the, than what we wanted to originally spend. Yeah, right. But it had balanced busing, and it, had, and it was like the latest technology right. at the time. It was very close sounding to the best boards that were out there at the time. Okay. Um, was that the first board that you had in the Raven building? Yes, that was the only board that we used in the Raven okay, building. Okay, gotcha. So okay. we never... You never even moved we, the other one. The other one we sold to, to Henrik, Henrik and, and then uh, by during, the time it came in, and then when it came in, and it's like and Keith and I were notorious for picking boards that had all the features we wanted on them. And never looking that close at the physical measurements of the oh, thing. <laughs> so yeah. it's like it shows up and it's like, holy smokes, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we never thought of that. We never thought of that. So. And, and the studio was on the second floor? It was on the so second floor. So you had to floor. go up those big we old wooden get stairs there, get, get right away? Up. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> that had to be quite a day. Oh, yeah. Get some strong guys. Oh, we got a whole bunch of team of strong yeah. guys to carry the thing up because <laughs> it wasn't light either. I bet. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so you have that board until the end? We had that board until the end, yes. And And is this, um, we talked at the very beginning, and Twang versus TRS. This when was now. To, was it just TRS at It was at just Raven? TRS at that point in time. It's it, Okay. When if we first started out, we were calling it Twang. But at some point, whatever, when we started to do more business production things, every. None of these things were planned out. It was just, they just kind of happened. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you really evolved the whole studio did, obviously, from a technology standpoint, but then also from a format and from the type of music that and you, you type recorded of, to. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and you're still at this point at, obviously, you're at I Warren Radio. I was still Radio. at Warren Radio at this How time. long did you stay there? I was there for 13 years. 13 years. And then? And then I left to do the recording studio. Full time, full time, which I did for five or six years. That, you know, that's why I always like to ask uh, uh, the musicians about their favorite gigs, their craziest gigs, and stuff. But from a recording standpoint, you must have seen every aspect of it. Oh, I saw you every know. aspect. I mean, of it. you've so. brought me some CDs. You brought me, you know, some yeah. uh, cassettes. What are what were some of your favorites over the years? Okay, um, bands, not bands. Okay, well. Um, I enjoyed doing Zipper City Blues Band because I'd always been, I really liked the blues. You're a blues oh, fan. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I'm not exclusively a blues person or whatever, but, you know, I was, you know, locked, a lot of, liked all of the Clapton stuff that he did with, with was blues oriented. Right, with B.B. Um, King. And, uh, yeah, yeah. B.B. King and Michael Bloomfield. And, I mean, there's, wow, you yeah. know, I Good mean. guitar player, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. And yeah. A, a lot of different um, other, 
not all of them are coming yeah, right no, at the top yeah. of my head. But I really enjoyed the blues. So this was, I mean, nobody else was playing the blues back right. then. So uh, they came in, and they were wonderful to work with. They were wonderful to record. It was, uh, they wanted to do it live because, you know, and we could talk about that. Some people are really good at performing live, but don't do a great job in the recording studio. Yeah, yeah. And other people are studio conscious, and you put them in a recording studio, and they do amazing stuff. But you get them on a stage where they have to duplicate it, sure. and it's they just don't capture that same feel. Like in sports, you're like a in game sports. player or you're a practice player. Or you're, right. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. the, so it was the same thing there. So they were uh, they were definitely one of those bands that it's like awesome you, live. You want the awesome live, yeah. And they had a the place was packed that night, whatever. This was at the play, play space, space, right you know, upstairs. Up yeah, stairs, again, lug were, all your stuff we up. Had to lug everything yep. upstairs. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> which is why I didn't do those kinds of things very often. Whatever the void, I brought that one. Keith didn't work on that one at all. Um, they really wanted me to do it because they had heard some of the Tripod Jimmy stuff and sure. whatever. And these guys were younger guys, and they were looking for sort of like a psychedelic kind of sound. They were um, they listened to uh, Grateful Dead, and they this listened to Mike Graham and those guys. Yeah, Mike yeah, Graham right, and those guys. Right, yeah. So that's where they were into, and they were like, you know, John, we'd like to do this. John, we'd like to have a backwards guitar part on this song. Sure. Okay, yeah, yeah okay, I can do that, you know. And they're not recording live, they're recording. They're doing everything in the studio. Okay. So yeah. it's like, and uh, they were great guys to work with. I really enjoyed doing that. Yeah. They had, all, you know, they they had songs that they wanted sound effects on. So we, I would take a portable cassette recorder and we'd drive out in the middle of the woods in the middle of the yeah. night and <laughs> record peepers and whatever. And, gotcha. And yeah. dub that kind of stuff. So it was it, fun. They, it was fun and yeah. it was interesting. And they were a great bunch of guys to work with. The only thing that <laughs> ended up happening with this, Greg Ropp, the um, the leader of the band, mm-hmm. uh, his parents fronted all the money to, and paid the whole thing and whatever. So, so eventually he took all the tapes. And then when CDs came out, he remixed it someplace else and whatever, and everybody in the bell, the rest of the guys in the band, hated his oh, remix. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they were like, "Don, don't even bother to listen to it because it sounds horrible." Gotcha. <laughs> so, so One World Tribe's a big band. Um, so One World Tribe was a big band, and uh, I'm trying to think because I had done all of these various shows for at that time at the Warner Theater. So I had done some Philharmonic shows. I had done some of the Philharmonic's pop shows. Okay. I had done both Marguerite's and Jay Long's dance shows or whatever. Right. And then for a while, because the days when that year and a half when the studio was kind of in between or whatever, right. the Warner said, John, we have all these Broadway shows that are coming in, and they want somebody that really knows their stuff. Oh. Will you uh, come down and work the shows? And I said, sure, I can come down and work the shows. Because at the time, I was like in between war and radio. Yeah. I was in between all these things. And like everybody else, I needed money to eat yeah, and do right, other right, things. Right. So, uh, so I did all of that. So that's where I got to know Mark Marchant, who was the oh. timpanist with the Erie Philharmonic. Oh, okay. And he also taught percussion at Mercyhurst College. And then Brad Amadon was one of the other percussionists in the orchestra. His mother, uh, Gloria Amadon, had been a f- previous uh, president of the Philharmonic, whatever. So I knew them. So they int- they brought in Kennedy Thompson, and the three of us sat and talked about what they wanted to do. And they told me, and you know, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. And then it was like, John, you know, we're going to bring in a whole horn section and whatever. Right. Which they did. Which by that time, I had already met Dave Stevens, okay. the trombone player. And then once or twice before, whatever, Brian Hanna, the trumpet player, had come in and done some tracks because... It's like, and I met Brian because he worked at one of the uh, car rental places. And I, when I was traveling to Canada, or whatever, I didn't want to take my own car, vehicle, whatever. So, so, I, so I yeah. called. He said, John, you know, you, thanks for calling me for doing this track in the studio. If you ever need a rental car, give me a call. So Perfect. again, I built relations. Yeah, know, right, right. With people, whatever. So 
he was in the band. And then, of course, they had lined up for sax and flute, um, Bruce Johnstone. Bruce Johnstone, sure, right, yeah. I don't have to tell you who Bruce is. So that's, is. yeah, tell the folks, I mean, he's okay, well, well-known, yeah, you know. Yeah, so Bruce Johnstone had played uh, baritone sax. Well, for, at, the, at the time, he was rated the number three baritone sax player in the world. I don't know who number one and two were. <laughs> um, but anyway, Bruce Johnstone's an amazing musician. Right. Um, he had played with Mater Ferguson. Mm-hmm. He had played with um, well some of the other big bands or whatever. I'm trying to Mater Ferguson. I have his records that he plays. Yeah, on. okay. He's just an amazing player. Great guy, incredibly funny. When we were doing that uh, the One World Tribe album, whatever, we needed an extra part because they had four part horns sketched out for certain things. And he had come in to play baritone sax, and then we had a trombone, and we had a trumpet. We didn't have something for a high note. Okay. And Bruce was like, no problem. I can play alto and baritone sax at the same time. So he's got two saxes in his mouth, kind of like Ross on Roland Kirk did. Holy cow. And uh, four-part horns, and it was done with three guys Live wow. in the studio. Wow. So those are memorable. Those are memorable yeah. things. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, sure. when you just get guys who come in and it's like, you know, and they I have it. to say the same things with Dave Stevens and uh, right, right, and uh, Brian Hanna. Again, a lot of times when you get horn players that aren't used to playing funky music or jazz music or something like that, yeah, that are just schooled horn players you know they don't know how to go bump 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 you know and give you the kicks and whatever sure right right these guys were pros um you know one thing we really haven't talked about is keith Keith. you know did you record some of keith's stuff or did he do all that himself no well see that's why i brought you this one because um, we haven't yeah keith wrote half of the songs uh tim wrote the other half of the songs and uh and then Ouija Boys. Yeah. Ouija Boys. Ouija Boys. So anyway, so uh, Keith. But in those earlier recordings did, like with ATV and those. With ATV, sometimes Keith would, well, Keith recorded a lot of the ATV stuff live. Oh, okay. So by that time, he had bought, again, needed a bigger, with more inputs, recording board and whatever. And so this company called Studio Mixer, again, out of England, came out with a bigger board with more controls on it, and Keith was like, boy, this is what I need for live. Yeah. It came out, and it was like a foot longer than this table. Okay. And then Keith was like, again, we didn't, he didn't look at the measurements of the thing. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So for four or five years, he called that thing around with him. Yeah. Live everywhere he played or whatever, but it had enough outputs that he would take the eight-track recorder and plug it into this, and we'd record ATV live. So, oh, okay. So all he right. was recording all of those things. A lot of times he would mix them himself. That's what I wonder. So sometimes yeah. he would call me up and said, you know, John, um, you know, can, he'd call me up and he'd have a rough mix already set, and he goes, I just want you to listen to it and tell me what you think, you know. And I'm, okay, right. Oh, yeah, most of the time it was Keith. It sounds great. Uh, other times there would be little things that I would tweak. For example... On this one here. The Ouija Boys. The Ouija Boys. There's a song that's called uh, Slow Boat to China. Okay. And Keith is playing a, uh electric sitar oh. to give it kind of a uh, Eastern, orient- sound. E- Eastern yeah. Oriental kind of sound. Right. And so he was playing this um, riff and whatever, and I was liking it. And then all of a sudden he got to the end. I said, Keith, it sounds great, except... There's one note in the middle that I don't like that note, and I'd like you to play something else. He goes, which one? I, you know, again, I'm not. Yeah, you're not going to be able to say. I can't say e bar, flat, bar that, four, right, yeah, yeah. E flat and bar four, you know. So we would, we, he would start it, and he'd start playing the part again, and we'd get to, I said, that note right there. And he goes, oh, okay, well, you want me to play this note? I go, no, that's not what I hear. You want me to play this note? No, that's not what I hear. Okay, you want me to play this note? No, that's not what I hear. You don't want me to play this. That's the one I want. And he's like, <laughs> it was all like a passing tone. Thing. Right. And right. it's like it wouldn't be something that because of 
rock pl- being mostly a rock player, he wouldn't normally play. Gotcha. But right. Because right. I listened to more esoteric music and whatever. Yeah. It was. Yeah. To me, it felt like the right note. So then he learned it playing it with that note, and you know he was like, "Yeah, I think you're right, John. I think that's good, the better. Co- yeah. I think it was a good call." So every now and then. We would just, and that's why he liked to bounce things. We'd bounce things off of each other because, again, sometimes I'd be mixing things. And, well, it's like this. When it got to this, he was like, John, you're not going to get the right kick drum sound that they're looking for. One World Tribe. Yeah. One World Tribe because he had, Brad was playing a jazz set and a jazz right. bass drum and a rock bass drum don't sound anything like alike. So right. Keith was better at setting up the equipment and okay we're gonna take the drum on the drum track on the tape and we're gonna trigger the drum machine and use the kick drum that i have on the drum machine huh. sounds like a good partnership I mean, oh as far yeah as so we work together and really uh, well yeah. yeah we had our moments like everybody does but i would say you know over the years we got along very 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 well and we worked together And we liked working with each other. How long did the studio, when did it close? It closed, I want to say, about the mid-1990s. Okay. And it just just got to the point where I was doing too many things with, at first, I just started bowing out of more things and more things and more things. And then... From a studio standpoint. From the studio standpoint, because I was doing too many things. So you kind of bowed out of the studio So I just bowed out of... Out out of the studio. Did Keith continue for a Keith while? Keith c- continued for a while because at that time the heavy metal thing was taking. There were kind of two things that were taking off in metal in music. The metal thing was taking off. There would be more bands that were starting to be like ACDC or doing that kind of music and whatever. Yeah. Um, this is late nineties, you said. Yeah. Well, this is like <laughs> the mid nineties. Okay. And at the same time, in the early nineties and then whatever. The whole rap music thing started to take off. Right, right. I wondered about that. I did not want to do any of that at all. In fact, the only rap thing I ever did is there's one kind of rap tomb on One World Tribe. Okay. It's the next to the last track. And it had a musical background to it, even though it's kind of a rap track over the top. Only rap track i ever ever did did. and the only reason i did it because i wanted to do the rest of the songs sure whatever but uh but so he kind of picked up and doing some of that no well no no he was really (laughs) didn't want to do that either so we were turning people away left and right and so there wasn't as much business and whatever but there were still there were still people who were bringing in some of that kind of music and he and rick DeBello kind of like came in and started doing some things because mm. Rick um, had known both of us for a long time. Sure. Right. Rick and Keith had gone to school together. Right. So uh, so Rick was coming in and doing things and helping Keith out at the time, but then it just got to the point where then the building started to fall apart. Oh, you're still, still at Raven. We're still at Raven. Yeah. Okay. Right. And right. then so when yep. Keith moved everything to his home on new home on East Gore. Then it was like he started doing some things. I started helping him put some things together, whatever. But other than some personal projects that he started working on, he never really brought anybody else in to work on anything there. Okay. And that's when he got the first signs that he was getting sick. Okay. And then it was just uh, so when he got the first signs of getting sick, that's when he decided it was time for us to sell the board while he was still in good enough help Mm. to help. Help me do things like that. So he called me and he goes, John, I know you haven't been here in a while, whatever, but we really need to sell this. And I got a customer who wants to buy it. Keith, Hmm. you tell me when you want me and that's where I'm going to be. He said, how about if we do one day a week and then if we have to, we can kick it up to two days a week. But let's just start with one day a week. You tell me what day. You tell me what time. You get proper priority. I'm putting everybody else on hold. Yeah, right. And uh, right. And so it was like that until the the very end. And I was, uh, other than his wife, I was the last person to see him alive. What year was that? Was it 2007, 2006? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it was 2008. How old was he? How old was he? Well, let's see here. It's 2021. I was turned 68. 
So right. in 2011, I would have been 58. So let's say I was 55, 54, 55. Gotcha. And, right. and I were the same age. He was, he was just a month and a half older than me. When you separated that, or when you uh, sold off that last board, had you guys already separated as a partnership from the? No, we oh, okay. we were you technically were a partnership till the very That's end. That's great. Yeah. Right. So. Right. Uh, when he was busy getting other things started, I had more free time. Then when I got Perfect. too busy, he had more free time. Right, right. And we were just interweaving in and out and staying in touch with each other, but whatever. But then it just right. finally, um, when the ceiling started caving in at Raven and uh, there were things, it was just, Keith yeah. was like, I can't gotta get out of here. here. We got to get out of here. <laughs> and yeah. So. Well, that's great. I mean, I appreciate you going through that whole tale because it's a long one. You it's know? a long one. Yeah. Well, we did that for a long time. Yeah. I didn't, you know, and maybe I was giving you, people say sometimes, John, you give too many details. That's but, all right. I but, like uh, details. Yeah. No, that's great. And, you know, Keith was one of those guys that's kind of beloved in this town. Oh, and, and well, that you know. was that was the other thing that right before he passed away, they came out with this thing that they were going to call it uh, – Eerie Music something or whatever awards. Right. And the first one that they were going to give out, they were going to give a Lifetime Achievement Award to Keith Mascheco. Yeah, right. The Rock Eerie Music Awards. The Rock Eerie Music Awards. Yeah, you would know the name better than me. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Keith wasn't interested in getting an award. Mm. And so then they came to me and said, well, John, will you accept the award for Keith? And I said, no, Keith... Keith and I are like this. Right. When Keith says no, I, I say, say no. no. Right. Okay. Gotcha. So nobody accepted the award, and we told them that in advance. I think they, I don't know who they gave it to or if they just announced that he was getting it and that nobody was there to pick up the award or whatever gotcha. because we had. But Keith was like, and it was the same with me. If somebody said, you know, that's why even coming here to do this. Yeah. If Durf hadn't talked me into it, you wouldn't you wouldn't see me sitting here. <laughs> well, in thank this you, chair Durf. Right now, okay? That's right. I appreciate because, it. Because yeah. um, he was a good friend of yours. Yeah, we were we were just good friends. Yeah. We became friends. We didn't, you know, when we originally started this, we didn't think about starting a business. We just wanted to do some things and do this for friends and something we both enjoy doing. Right, have fun and, and have fun doing yep. it. And then it got to be bigger, and then it got to be bigger, and then we had to go <laughs> spend men more money at it, and it's just like whatever. And the next thing you know. You got a business going, and there's all kinds of people coming right. to you. You're getting called from everybody to do this, and the same way that it went up, it kind of gradually gradually came down. Came down. Sure, sure. And uh, you know, so it's like, and and a lot of that probably. I mean, like we talked about technology. I mean, as it was coming down, there was everything had gotten smaller. You're able to record everything. Yes. Now on yes. an iPad on an iPad. You know, yes. Well, and that you know, was so and that was the studios. other. That's the other thing that happened right about that time. Yeah. Right about the in the nineties when all those other things were happening, we had just bought an ADAT machines, which were recording um, eight channels of a. Uh, digital audio right. onto a VHS, super VHS tape. Yeah. And so we had three of the machines so we could stack them and do 24 tracks. Right. And then we knew somebody that had a fourth machine. So if we needed to bounce things around or whatever, I, we could borrow this fourth machine. Well, then then all of a sudden the ADAT started disappearing and then the, every, every, it started to switch to computer hard drives. Right. And then that started disappearing and something, I mean, it was like, and Keith and I were like, you know what? Can't keep up. We can't yeah, keep up. Right. Yeah. And then so eventually it got to the point where it's like, I don't know how many big studios there are in the country. Right. A lot of them closed. But yeah. oodles of them closed. Right. Right. Well, this was well, great. I appreciate you giving us the uh, the oral history of uh, Twang TRS and a little bit about Keith, you know, because a lot yeah. of people remember him very fondly. Oh well, yeah. And, um, um, a lot of folks have talked about Keith on on this podcast over the years. Oh and, well, everybody, and, uh, you know, um, again at his at Keith's funeral, and I was there, and people were kind of expecting me to get up and give a bit of a eulogy or something, but Steve McConnell said that he wanted to do that. 
and I was okay with that. But again, Steve McConnell met Keith when he was only 16 or right. something like that. Exactly. And right. uh, there were Steve, a- Steve was a very talented drummer, but people didn't give 16-year-old kids back then a chance at things or whatever. Right. Keith did. Yep. Same way he did with me saying, John, I didn't really have any reputation, but he said uh, to Ed, can... I have John mix our band, whatever. We right. only got six more gigs to play, and I did. Sure. And that's how, that's we, how he was. And that's how he was. Yeah. And he was that way with everybody, and he yep. built relationship with everybody. And there were very few people that he refused to work with, and I won't name who no, they were. No, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> but, there were lots of guys that that attribute their their – Guitar knowledge and everything to him, you know. Everything because he could play all kinds of styles and whatever. And that you'll hear some of that on these things. Is like uh, that's great. On that is that you know, he could play an acoustic solo on a song that you wouldn't expect to hear an acoustic guitar. He would play electric sitar on a song that you weren't expecting to hear that. He could do. just heavy rock things. He could do kind of folk things. The other thing that kind of brought me and Keith together in the early days is, is uh, when I, the first show that I did for him with Anna Crucis, they did a song by the Bee Gees on uh, uh, New York Mining Disaster 1941, which was like the Bee Gees' first single okay. in the United States bombed but it was on the Bee Gees greatest hits album and Keith loved the harmonies on it and this guy was into vocal You're harmonies into harmonies and yeah I had the, the same Bee Gees album <laughs> and I was like now this is cool yeah and so yeah. Right, Keith and I hit it off musically. <laughs> right, even though you weren't a musician, you definitely we hit it had, off that we way. We had yeah. th- things that we loved to listen to, and yeah. so over the years, I mean, and I didn't talk about that, but you know, I'd pick up an album someplace, or somebody would tell me, "John, you got to go get this," and he would, you know, like pick up somebody, and somebody would tell him about Ten CC, and he goes, "Then John, you got to hear this track." And so yeah, he'd, yeah, he'd play for me, you know. Um, I'm not in love off the 10 CC sure. and it's like I'm there going, wow, this is amazing, you know, because it's a yeah, 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 right, you know, right. And all these sonically, there's sonically, a lot going those on. a lot, Absolutely. a lot of things it's going not on just, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, so you guys definitely bounced off. So those we types bounced of things off of too. things. And one yeah. of the things that the guys in One World Tribe did that I had picked up was we both Keith and I both would get recording magazines from all over the world, and whatever, and sure. we're reading reviews of these things. And one of the guys who did. The Steely Dan albums is engineer named Roger Nichols. Okay. And I'll close with this story. Yeah. Is that um, everybody would like to listen to these Steely Dan records about me. Everything is like right in your face. Okay. And so there was a thing and he talked about how he did that. And he would pull an oscillator out of his board or or a remote one. And he would set the pan pots on the board for the various instruments with an oscillator and watch it on the meters and he'd set them a db and a half apart and so the the guitar had its own little spot right the keyboard had its own little spot the bongos had their own little spot the horn uh, so trumpet it separated whatever. everything it separated everything yeah and so when i did this we were starting to mixing it and they were like gee it doesn't sound like it did when john was ever and i said Keith looked at me and he said, what were you doing? And I said, the oscillator thing. Yeah. And so Keith goes, John, I'll take a break. You go set it all up. And then when they came back in and started to play the tape, it was like everything popped. had its popped sure. and whatever. And that's the thing that people comment on this cool. album cool. about is that no matter how complicated, they had so many things going in the mix, you can you hear, hear everything, everything. Yeah. because... So thank you, Roger Nichols, for that one. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, John Mazza, for coming in. And, you know, we've made reference to it a few times. This Ouija Boys CD that you gave me with Keith and uh, Tim Turner uh, is probably no one has heard this. Nobody so, has heard this. So you'll, at some point you'll have to give me some feedback. On yeah, it. So, I'm going to uh, post some of those uh, tracks uh, on the episode uh, page for John's uh, episode here. So, But thank you very much for coming. This has been great. Thanks, Thanks for having me. All right. That's it for this episode, but remember, I always post photos of the person I interview on their episode page at eriemusichistory.com. That's all one word. And if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, 
and look up Erie Music History, and you can pledge a few bucks. My thanks to everyone who has been a supporter so far. Also, I always like to mention Jack Stevenson's Two Man Happy Hour podcast, which is where you'll find out who's playing where and when these days in Erie. That's the number two manhappyhour.com. Uh, thank you to our sponsor, the JPT Foundation, as usual. Uh, they have that great bingo hall that is available for rent up on West 38th Street. All right, that's it for me. I'm Chip Shell. Thanks for listening to the Erie Music History Podcast. <laughs>